notice Pastor Tom didn't let me use his, his nickel mic this time. So I'm going to switch that. He gave, gave me this one. <laughs> I, I want to talk about this message simply entitled, That I May Know Him. That's, that's, I, I've been, when, when you're called out to build something, how, how many of you all run your own business out there and you, you're on your own business? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it gets scary out there. Every business owner looked at me and said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and and, and you, you, you're, you're, you're everything in that. And, and I'm in this state where God is good. There was a contract that was supposed to come in July. It got delayed. And I had a good bit of reserves. And you know, if you're an entrepreneur, reserves, uh, they're not reserved for long. <laughs> but God kept sustaining me and giving me more and more and opportunity here and in the midst of all of it I didn't want the opportunity I just simply wanted God more of God and that's what I want to talk to you about on tonight that I may know him Let, let's go to Philippians chapter 3 I'm not going to read it all I know homiletically those that study the art of preaching you should read the bible and the verse one through all the way in context so i'm going to jump to the middle if you don't mind and then trust that you'll get a chance to go back and read it when you go home are you going to do it you're going to do it you're going to read all of philippians chapter three it's really good stuff let's go to verse seven it says this in the new king new king james but what things were gained to me these I have counted loss for Christ. I want you to hear that Paul is speaking to us on tonight. Verse 7, once again. But what things were gained to me, the things that I've obtained through my own doing, I counted them all loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. King James Version would say as dung, that I may gain Christ. Are we following what Paul is saying? Look at verse 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness. Pastor Tom was just preaching this on Sunday. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through what? Faith in who? Christ the what? Righteousness which is from who? By faith. Our righteousness is by God, from God, by faith. Verse 10. I'm just going to read those few words. That I may know him. Why am I counting all as lost? Why am I willing to walk away from the very thing that makes me famous? Paul is saying. Why am I ready to let go of everything that I've worked for? Because when Paul came to know Jesus Christ for himself on the road to Damascus, nothing else mattered in his life ex except having more of God. And saints of God, if you want to go to greater dimensions in God, you can't place anything in your life ahead of God. There's a statement. We've heard it. We've seen it on church, church uh, signs. We've seen it on, on, on bumper stickers. It says either he's going to be Lord of all or he can't be Lord at all. Where is he? In your life. I often say. When I'm preaching. That the believer. If we can get one thing right. Can I just teach a little bit in here. If we can just get one thing right in our life. Your life as a believer will be so much more successful. Because there's only one thing we are called to do. And the very thing that we're called to do. Is the hardest thing that we're called to do. The hardest thing for a believer to do is believe. That's pretty profound, wasn't it? I didn't have to study long for that. 
I just had to do wrong to understand that I was doing wrong, trying to do it myself, when the only thing I had to do was simply believe. You don't have a money problem. You have a belief problem. You don't have a sin problem. You have a belief problem. You haven't believed that you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You haven't believed yet that you have been made completely righteous. Somebody lift your hands to God right now. Lift them up, lift them up and say, I have been made completely righteous. Do you all believe that? I said, do you believe it? One more time, one more time. Lift your hands to God. And say, I have been made completely, totally, fully righteous in God through Christ Jesus. Come on, clap your hands and give them praise. Now, I just need about two church people to join me as I'm preaching. Are you all here? I can remember probably as early as four years old having a deep love for God. Grew up in the church. My father was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. Grew up in my father's church. So uh, as they say, I was born in this thing. And I can remember as early as four years old, I, I was that kid that mom did not have to uh, uh, go in there, get up for church. I wanted to be at church at four. I wanted to to give to God. I remember we we used to have Sunday school. If you're old enough and been in church long enough, you remember Sunday school. We went to Sunday school, and and I went to the the youth, the primary class, and they needed, we gave offering, and I learned to give, and I remember I loved giving so much that my father gave me $20 to give, and I gave the entire $20. I went back to my father before the church transition from Sunday school to the main church. He said, where's my change? I said, Dad, what are you talking about? He said, I gave you $20. Where's my change? He didn't comprehend that a four-year-old loved and understood giving enough that if you give him money, he's giving it all. I gave the entire 20. He said, you did not give that. He took me to my Sunday school teacher and said, Debbie, did he give the full? He said, Pastor Knight, he gave the full $20. I just always have had a love for God. I've sensed his presence. I knew God was real, not because of mom, not because of dad, but because I knew him. Now, this is not to say, well, Barry, that's, you, 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 you grew up in this thing. Because there are many people who just got saved about maybe two years ago who God delivered you out of sin and out of drugs and out of alcohol. And you know God just as well, if not better, as any other believer that has been serving him for 20, 30 years. So it's not about time. It's about intimacy. When I saw my wife, I said, I'm marrying her. I didn't have to know her, date her. We never dated. We planned a marriage. Am I telling the truth? I called her on the phone. Come on, talk back to me. And I said, I'm not looking for a friend or a girlfriend. I'm looking for a wife. If you don't want to be one, don't waste my time. Was that the first thing I said to you? Why? Because it's not about time. It's about intimacy. So don't worry, Pastor Barry, Pastor Tom, Pastor Heather, Pastor Felix, you guys have been in church all your life. Of course you know him better. It's not about time. It's about intimacy. How willing are you willing to be close to him? It's about how willing you are to know him and his power. How willing are you? Leave all for all of him. I've known him. The only way, saints of God, that you're going to know God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, on a deeper level is by way of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to go King James Version on you, and I'm going to say the Holy Ghost. New King James NIV and all the other translations, it's the Holy Spirit. Same person, the Holy Spirit is not an it. Ooh, I caught it today. Well, he wasn't running from you. 
So I'm going to tonight, just for the sake of consistency with the message, refer to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost, same person, God in three persons. If you want to become closer to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. I'm not going to go deep in that theological or hermeneutical because I just don't have time. But you need the Spirit of God. And when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, that simply means that all of God lives inside all of you. Somebody say, when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, all of God lives inside all of me. And does that make you feel a little better? There's no mountain that can stand against all of God. There's no cancer that can stand against all of God. There's no fear that can stand against all of God. Come on, there's no mountain that can get in the way of what God is trying to do in your life when you have all of God living on the inside of all of you. But the problem with many churches, not this church, but other churches, is that we're treating the Holy Ghost as if he's the dessert and not the main meal. You, you, you all know, if, if you're anything like me, you, you get the appetizer, and then you get the salad, and then you have the soup, and then you have your main course, your steak, your potatoes, and your vegetables, and then the waiter comes around and has the audacity and the mitigated gall to ask after he sees you leaning over about to fall out in a coma because you ate too much, he says, would you like to look at the dessert menu, uh, the dessert menu? and we look at him and say, no. I can't, I can't, because we've already eaten and filled ourselves up with too much that we cannot now receive the dessert. And that's how we've treated the Holy Ghost in many churches. As long as I have friends in church, I'm good. Because I don't have enough to consume the consuming power or the room to consume anymore. Uh, I, I jumped, I shouted, I danced, I did all that. But now God is saying, I don't want to be the dessert. I want to be the main meal. So that when you have the Holy Spirit, you don't have any more room for worry. When you have the Holy Spirit and you become full of him, you don't have any room for fear. You don't have any more room for envy. You don't have have any more room for worry because you've been so filled with him. I just want to know who wants to be filled. Come on, come on. Because in the next 10 minutes, we're getting ready to flood the altar. And we're getting ready to go like we've lost our mind. And we're getting ready to seek God like we've never sought him before. Come on, people of God. How many of you all want him just, just lift your hands and say, Lord, I want to be full of you. Come on, say it again. Lord, I want to be full of you. God, I come on, say, say, Lord, I want so much of you to where worry can't fit in me. Fear can't fit in me. Anger can't live within me. Come on now, shout out as loud as you can. Say, Lord, fill me again. I just want to be filled. So for to truly know Christ isn't based on what he can do. It's based on who he is. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. He's a rewarder. You're going to get it when you diligently seek him. Not seeking things, not seeking man, not seeking boyfriend, not seeking girlfriend, husband, wife, not seeking your job for your source, but seeking him. You seek him, he provides. You pray to him, he provides. You become filled with him, he overflows from you. Are you with me here? I love that song, Darlene, that you sing on Sunday. I was ministering it all week long. Put it on YouTube. Put it on my TV. And, 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 and I got rid of my dumb TV. I have a smart TV now. 
And, and I, I was listening to the words, and it's amazing how church people, this is an apostolic me message. I'm coming with that mantle on. I, I'm amazed with how people can, can, can know God and sing, but then go, go home and forget the manner of God that they were just worshiping. And the words were simply, he's in the waiting. And I sat there and I said, God, do we really understand what we just sang? He's in, how many of you all were here Sunday? He's in the waiting. Somebody say, he's in the waiting. He's in the waiting. Psalm 23 say, says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he's here. Even in the evil, he's here. He's in the waiting. I don't have it yet, but he's in the waiting. I haven't received my answer yet, but he's in the waiting. I haven't got my healing yet, but he's in the waiting. I haven't got my full deliverance yet, but he's in the waiting. My child is not saved yet, but he's in the waiting. My husband, my spouse is not saved yet, but he's in the waiting. I didn't get the raise yet, but he's in the waiting. I didn't get the promotion yet, but he's in the waiting right here with me. But you will never know he's with you until you know him for who he is. Now I'm going to give you five types of people. And I, I want you, I hope you're in the fifth. Four people follow him. And I want you to write this down. Some follow him simply because of demonstration. Jesus said in John 6, he said to the crowd, he said, the only reason you're following me is because you ate of the loaves and ate the fish. Because if you didn't see me demonstrate power, you wouldn't follow me. And there are some people who I call power chasers. As long as it seems like it's powerful and mystical, then they want to follow. But if they don't see signs like they think they should, then they want to tiptoe out and say, well, God doesn't move there. Y'all been preaching all my life. I've been preaching a long time now. I have people at my church. <laughs> I'm telling my own story, telling my testimony. So they only follow God for what he can do. That's why many people don't tithe. Because you're looking for God to demonstrate something to you first. To tell you or to, uh, uh, to, 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 to push and energize your faith to do what he told you to do first. God, I'll tithe if you'll give me a raise. You've had three raises now. You've promoted four times and you still haven't tithed. Because I don't tithe until I know him. That's why it's for mature believers. Tithing is for mature. Mature people who know him. I love giving my wife money every month. And she has a job. But I like when I can take it out of my pocket and put it in her hand and slam it on the table. I said, baby, you better go spend that money. <laughs> Simply because of my relationship didn't hear me. Most people follow God, many people rather, because of demonstration. I have to see God. I have to see you do this first. If I can see you bless in God, then I'll do. If I can see you provide, then I'll do. God, if you do this first, then I'll do this. God, if you do this, then I'll go do that. Then there's another group of people, number two, that follow God because of the congregation. As long as I'm around other people, I can follow him. As long as Brother Rufus worships, and as long as Sister Darlene worships, and as long as, as Sister Hillary and Brother Leon and all the musicians worship, then, then I can vibe, I can feel God. But as soon as I go home by myself, and I have to meet the adversity face to face when there is no more keyboard, when there is no more worship singers singing, the reason we go home and we face that adversity and we fall in the adversity is because we only knew him in the congregation. Do you know God? Where you can be sitting in a room all by yourself. See, I don't know about you all, but may maybe if, if, if the Lord ever time it right for you to drive by, when I'm having a Holy Ghost fit in my car, 
Sometimes I'm like, God, don't do this right. I'm driving. I'm already speeding. You, you know. I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry. Don't do that. Don't, don't show me how good you are while I'm driving. God, don't you, don't, don't you speak that good word to me while I'm driving? God, don't you show me how big you are while I'm driving? Are you with me? Why? Because I don't need music to prompt me to praise. I need my relationship. All I need to do is think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. Then my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. All I have to do is sing. There's a few people in here that can just think about all the things that God has done in your life. There's, all, there's a few people, all you have to do is just think back not even long ago to how God raised you up from a place that you never thought you would get out of. There's only a few people in here. You don't have to think back five years ago. You can think back five days ago and remember what God did did and it's enough to cause you to lift your hands it's enough to cause you to run it's enough to cause you to open your mouth and give God the biggest praise but you have to know him the third group of people they only follow him out of frustration pastor everything is going well I know I haven't been to church in six months. Family is going to the lake house again. Things are wonderful. Bills are paid. We'll see you soon, though. And don't worry. I'm not sending my tithe. Got to pay for the lake house. But then the winds of change happen in their life. And what they had, what they put their faith and trust in is no longer there. And they find themselves needing to come to the congregation, but not back to God. And these are the people I'm going to tell on you. Don't worry. If I'm talking about you, just keep looking at me. Nobody will know. <laughs> they come to here. You haven't seen them in months. They come to the altar, and they're just crying, crying, crying. And if you're a pastor, if you've ever been a pastor, you look at them like just... what you want me to do <laughs> because they only follow God because they're frustrated and as soon as God brings them out of that then they leave them again then there's the fourth type of people number one demonstration they have to see God do something number two congregation they can only feel God when other people are around the third are those that, that know God or follow God, rather, because of their frustration. They, they're in a bad moment, so they go and follow God. And the fourth type of people are those, listen to this, who follow God because of the adoration by occupation or the adoration of association. In other words, if I can hang with Pastor Tom and carry his Bible and walk up the, to the front and sit right by him... <laughs> Turn around and look at everybody in the back who didn't get the front seat like me. As long as I can get up here and worship the Lord and sing the worship song. I used to be a minister of music, a worship leader. So I understand singers. Singers are nasty people sometimes. One thing that I found out when I was a worship leader and I was a musician playing in the church is the person that came to me and said, Ooh, Elder Knight, Minister Knight, here's a beautiful song. I knew immediately that it was a song they wanted to lead. And as, I, as soon as I said, yeah, that's a great song. Hey, how about we get that person? The look on their face. Because they were only serving God based off of the adoration of the position they occupied or by the association that they had with other leaders in the church, or the association with the ministry. So as soon as change comes, and they come and say, Brother, you've been serving in that ministry so faithfully. I thank you for growing. I thank you for even launching the ministry. We wouldn't be here without you, but now I'm going to ask you if you would come over here and start leading. As soon as that change is made, then they become offended. Because they were never in love with Christ. 
They were love in love with the adoration of their occupation and the adoration of their association. I hope that not one person in here falls in any of those categories. And last but not least, there are those of us who know him not because of demonstration, not because of the congregation, not because of frustration, not because of the adoration of the association or occupation, but we simply know him by revelation. <laughs> How many of you all want to know God simply because he's God? This is what Paul is saying. I just need to know you. I'm going to read Philippians 3, 7 in the Living Bible. But if you go back to verse 3, Paul starts to say, listen, nobody can brag about what you've accomplished more than me. I'm of the stock of Israel, the top tiered, top echelon. I was from a wealthy class. I'm a wealthy man. I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews, which means look on my father's side. He was Hebrew all the way down to generations. Look on my mother's side, Hebrew. I'm of the great stock. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Which means that we are the favorite child of Jacob. Benjamin was the place where the temple rested. I'm from the great place. That would be our Beverly Hills. You, you know, Beverly Hills. This, this is what, this is, Paul would be indeed in, in, in indicative of saying that, that I, I grew up in the 90210. Come on, uh, 80s and 90s. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Uh, uh, you, you're with me here. I grew up in the 902101010 area code, uh, zip code rather, area code, whatever it is. <laughs> and, and, and I lived in a, a 14,000 square foot home with over 20 rooms in it. And, and, and I had a butler and I had the best of the best. I never had to get a license because we always had a chauffeur. I've never seen my mother know my father cook because we always had a cook in the kitchen. I never had to pick up after myself because we had a butler. This is basically what Paul is saying. But this then Paul came to know Christ and then he looked at Christ and looked at all of his wealth. He looked at Christ and then looked at all of the things that he've obtained. He looked at Christ and then looked at all of the material things that his parents gave him and that was bequeathed to him and he says all that means nothing to me. I'm willing to give it all up so that I can have more of Christ. So the question is are you going to stay in the land of demonstration? Are you going to stay in the land of the congregation? Are you only going to know God and follow him when you're frustrated and at your wit's end and don't know what to do? Are you only going to follow God because you have a great position in the church and great occupation and you serve people and you're on the prayer team, but as soon as someone moves you, the spirit of offense rises up in you and you have to leave. As soon as it's not applicable to where we're going anymore. You're offended. My question is, how well do you really know him? Everybody stand to your feet. Verse 7 says this in the Living Bible. But all these things that I once thought very worthwhile, now I've thrown them all away so that I can put my trust and hope in Christ alone. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I have put aside all else. Counting it worth less than nothing in order that I can have Christ and become one with him. No longer counting on being saved by being good enough or by obeying God's laws, but by trusting Christ to save me. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith, counting on Christ alone. Now I have given up everything else. I have found it to be the only way to really know Christ. Let me read that again. Now I have given up everything else. I have found it to be the only way to really know Christ and to experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again and to find out what it means to suffer and to die with him. 
for the last few moments that we have. We're not going to be long. I believe God is already here. If you're here, and I'm going to move as God instructed me with permission of the pastors. I'm going to do this real quick. Matter of fact, just stay in your seats. Stay in your seat because he's here. I want you to lift your hands to God. And I don't want you just to lift them as a Christian thing, churchy thing we do. I want you to lift because you're signifying, God, I got a lot of more room for you to live in me. God, 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 the preacher's talking to me because when I leave here, I find it hard to, to find you. I find it so hard to, to tap into you, God. I, 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 I try to open my Bible, but I just, I can't get close because I, th I think I've only known you and the congregation and, and, and I left with the grace of the anointing of the house but I never took the anointing to my house God I, I want you there too <laughs> God I can't even sing but I can lift a joyful noise to you God I can't play an instrument but, but, but I, I, can, I can clap my hands and, and give you the utmost praise I just really want more of you because when I look at all that's going on God it, it seems when I take inventory of my thoughts all I can see myself doing is looking for other things except you God I, I went to try to find the loan to get it paid I, I went to other people to help me out with my rent and with my car note I went to everybody else to try to help me get the job but but God when I think about it I only spent probably two minutes in, in, in prayer with you asking but then I went back to worrying and wondering and, and asking everyone else's opinion except yours when God you're the one who wants to prosper me and you're the one who wants to bless me and you're, you're the one who has great things uh, all everything in you is life and godliness God all I have to do is just come to you. Just come to you. Now I want you right where you are. I, I, I know this is kind of uncomfortable for some people. You don't come from loud churches and, and I'm not going to make you be loud, but, but God understands your heart. He understands you and your praise. Uh, the Bible says in John 10 that it, the sheep know